Last time on Graph Theory, we wrapped up Breath First Search and Depth First Search. So yeah, that's over. But one of the concepts we've looked at at that point will continue on for the next couple of episodes. And that is the concept of spanning trees. Now, back in those episodes, spanning trees were made equal. A graph can have many different spanning trees, and they are all equally valid. However, unlike the graphs from last time, this time we're going to add edge weights to the graph. And what this means now is that there is one best spanning tree that we can find, called a minimum spanning tree. Starting today, we delve into one of several algorithms on finding a minimum spanning tree. You're watching episode 7 of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. So today, we're going to start on our journey to find out more about minimum spanning trees. Starting today with an algorithm called Prim's algorithm, which is developed by computer scientist Robert Prim. As mentioned, its job is to find a minimum spanning tree in an undirected weighted graph. And the definition of a minimum spanning tree is, well, of course it has to be a spanning tree. And if we were to take all the edge weights in the spanning tree and we added them all together, the total edge weights must be minimized. What that means of course is that we should not be able to find another spanning tree that gives you a total that is smaller. Throughout this series, we're going to actually take a look at four different algorithms that generate minimum spanning trees. And well, you will realize that these four algorithms take somewhat different approaches to doing this. We're starting off with Prims because it looks a lot like depth first search and breadth first search. It starts from a particular node and sort of grows a tree from there. So yeah, that's why we're starting with Prims because it's familiar. So here's how we're going to structure this episode. We're going to start by looking at an intuitive version of Prim's algorithm. It's very easy to understand, particularly when we trace it. However, we'll soon find that that way of doing things is very inefficient. So we're going to move on to look at a faster, though less intuitive way of formulating the same algorithm. Then of course, with that done, we'll wrap up with some discussions about the time complexity of this algorithm. So with that said, let us jump into the intuitive formulation of the algorithm. Now, we do actually have an algorithm written here on screen, but we're not going to look at that. We're just going to try and see the picture. If you want to see the actual trace of this, I'll have it in a separate video. So the idea is we want to create a tree and start to grow it out from there. So in this case, we have a starting node. Let's make it H and well, the first thing we want to do to grow a tree is to look for all the edges outgoing from where our tree actually is. Then out of all the edges, which in this case we have indicated it in red, we want to pick the smallest one. In this case, of course, we pick 4. This leads us to the node L, and that is how we end up including L in the tree as well. With that done, we simply loop back and continue doing this until our tree grows and covers the entire graph. So once again, we look at all the edges outgoing from our tree. In this case, well, just these two edges. We pick 5, expanding the tree to node G. Once again, we look at all the nodes outgoing, and now the smallest one is 3, so we pick it. That leads us to D. So on and so forth. The whole idea is, of course, we pick the smallest edge every time. And as a result of doing this, we end up picking the edges that well, lends itself to generating a minimum spanning tree. So you see what we've done here, by picking the smallest of the edges each time, we actually implicitly ignore some of the larger edges. As you can see, the edges we've left out have edge weights 8 or 9, and of course, they don't really belong. So yeah, that is the intuitive understanding. And while that is all well and good, you realize that there is a problem. Every time we want to extend the tree, we have to go through many loops. We have to look for everything in the tree and look for all the outgoing edges, and then through all these edges, find the smallest one. So it's a process that is quite slow. 
but we can speed it up if we use a data structure called a priority queue. A priority queue is really just like a queue, except all elements in the queue are associated with a priority. And every time you dequeue something, well, we try to stick to the first in first out property as much as possible, but we will always prioritize the item with the smallest priority. So yeah, you'll see this in action later on. It basically looks like a queue that keeps resorting itself as the priorities change. So with that in mind, let us now take a look at the updated and faster version of the algorithm. As mentioned earlier, well, we're going to be using a priority queue. Instead of explaining it to you while looking at the algorithm, let's just jump into the trace. When you see it working, it makes a lot more sense. So first and foremost, we create a priority queue and we insert all the nodes into the queue, as you can see in this column. And of course, we set all their priorities to infinity. Now, I have this arrow saying next here. This is just to tell you that this is the top of the queue. Every time we say we want to dequeue the minimum from the priority queue, this will be the element that comes up. So right, next step, we want to actually set the priority of the starting node, which is H, to zero. As you can see, setting it to zero bumps it all the way to the top of the priority queue. And that is intentional, that is by design, because that's the whole point. We want to get things with the smallest priority first. So then, there are several steps that we have skipped over here, which is to create the concept of a parent array. For this implementation, we actually need to know which node leads to a particular node. Now, once again, this is something that we don't show on screen, but you'll see later that I'll indicate this using arrows. We'll talk about it when it happens. So right, first and foremost, the first thing we want to do is to get the minimum out. So as you can see, H is no longer here and I have it listed here because this is what we are looking at right now. Then we want to get all the neighbors of the current node, which is H. For each one of the neighbors, we want to check to see if these neighbors are in the priority queue. If they are, then we want to actually query the weight of these particular edges. If the weight of these edges are smaller than the priority of the nodes indicated, which in this case, of course they are, the original priorities were infinity. So since the actual weight is smaller, what we're going to do is we're going to set the parent of all these nodes to H. So what we're doing is we're actually creating a tentative minimum spanning tree. And we're saying that, well, all these are actually edges that we have accepted into our spanning tree. As mentioned earlier, we're using arrows. The parent node will be the side of the arrow without the arrow hit. So yeah, it points out, this is the parent, this is the child. It makes more sense this way. So yeah, we also change the priorities of these nodes that are leading out from our existing tree. And as you can see, changing that also bumps them to the top of the priority queue. So right, that's all there is for this one iteration. Let's move on to the next. So we remove the next item from the priority queue, which will be L, this guy here with a priority of four. We look at all its neighbors, then we realize it doesn't have neighbors, so we can move on. We dequeue the next item, which is G of priority five. We look at all its neighbors, and once again, we want to find out what their weights are, and then update them in the queue itself. Now, notice what is happening in this area. I'm going to go back to the previous slide. Notice that this connection going from H to D has now actually been knocked out in favor of this connection from G to D with a smaller weight. So that's cool because that's what we needed to do. We want to get to node D using an edge that has the minimum weight. But which part of the code actually makes this happen? As it turns out, it is this line here. If the current weight we have is smaller than the priority of this node, and we know it is because in the previous iteration it was set to 9. In fact, I'm going to go back a slide and you can see that here. See, because we have chosen this one, its priority here is actually 9. So that means this line holds true. So all these continues to run, and now what we're doing is essentially the parent of D has now been set to G. So it was originally set to H, but now we've replaced it and that is why this edge has disappeared. We also set its priority to this new one here, 
the value 3 and as you can see that actually bumps it all the way up to the top of the priority queue. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing, we can now move on. Once again, we dequeue the topmost item, that would be D. We don't have to do any other work because D does not have any outgoing edges. The reason why this happens is because of this line, if neighbor is in queue. As you can see, none of the neighbors G and H are in the queue, and that is why we don't have to bother processing them. So we move on once again, we pick the next edge out of the priority queue, which is the node F here, then we search through all its neighbors. And once again, we find that we actually have a much cheaper way to get to K, as opposed to from G. That is why we actually bump that off, and well, now we have a better way. So once again, we update all the priorities here, and we can move on to K, because of course, this is the next cheapest node. K only has one neighbor connected here, and well, that is the cheaper way to get to J, and therefore this edge gets eliminated. So yeah, this process just repeats over and over again. Now we have J, that gives us a way to get to E, E is picked, that gives us a way to get to both A and I, that gives us a way to get to B, and well, the next node we look at is B. Then all that remains are C and I, giving us these two edges. So yeah, we pick both of them, and we've actually completed the trace. Notice that ultimately, the minimum spanning tree we get looks exactly the same as the one we've gotten for the intuitive formulation, because really, they are the same algorithm. And also, well, there generally aren't that many different ways to generate a minimum spanning tree, thanks to the fact that the edges are weighted. And there you have it, that is basically how Prim's algorithm works. We've looked at it from an intuitive point of view, as well as the most popular formulation of the algorithm, which uses a priority queue. Now, this is the part where I have to talk to you about time complexity. Except really, moving forward for this series, it's not really something that's very easy to discuss, particularly when, you know, the data structures themselves bear discussion. In fact, for the case of Prims, we've already seen for ourselves that we can choose to not use an efficient data structure, and yet, it is still considered Prim's algorithm. Even if we do use it, a lot of the time is dependent on how the data structure actually operates. An efficient data structure will of course be quicker. So instead of going into all these nitty gritty details, we're gonna only look at Prim's algorithm. And we're gonna try and look at operations in general as the number of operations on the data structure. Now here's the deal. As we can see from the algorithm, we're making a total of V extractions from the priority queue. Then for every iteration, in the worst case, we have to update the priorities of all the edges connected to that particular node. So in fact, this is very similar to what we've already seen in breadth first search and depth first search, where for every node, we have to consider every one of the neighbors. As you've seen from my arrow drawing example, that adds up to a total of 2e. But we're not just doing 2e work, we're doing 2e times however long it takes to update the priority. So yeah, our discussion of time needs to stop here until we can find out how efficient these two operations are. And as mentioned, that is actually dependent on the data structure we've used. Priority queues can actually be implemented in many different ways. Obviously, the most naive way would be to just have an array that we keep sorting over and over. Of course, that's highly inefficient, so methods using heaps are actually used. Now, when it comes to heaps, there are also many different formulations, so we will not go there. So in fact, I'm going to show you some very common time complexities, using particular formulations of priority Q. If you use a binary heap, you get a particular time. If you use a Fibonacci heap, you get a different time. So yeah, that's basically it for Prim's algorithm. I know the timing discussion probably isn't as in-depth as you hoped it would be, but I think that is more or less enough to give us a very rough idea. Anyway, that's it. That's all there is for this episode. Next time, we'll continue to take a look at more techniques for us to generate minimum spanning trees. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. 
If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.